we have Ruben Esglov on. And did I get your name pronounced correctly, Ruben? You did, surprisingly. You didn't ask for practice before the call, so you did great. And, and I had meant to, so that's great. <laughs> so Ruben, has, he's got a ton of experience, and he's been in the real estate investing world in New York for quite some time, focusing on fix and flipping. He also has what's called WeLendLLC.com, and I'm going to send everybody to that website to see if there's any kind of synergy or something that they can, you can help each other with. Head over to WeLendLLC.com and to check out what Ruben and his team are doing. But really appreciate your time here, Ruben. Thank you so much for having me, Jack. It's a pleasure. So I got to jump right into the fix and flipping because I, I think that's always a hot topic. And that's where a lot of people start in real estate investing. What, first of all, why did you jump into that torture we call fix and flip? <laughs> Unfortunately, I wish I'd actually started there. Originally, I started wholesale. So I was good at, at finding distressed properties, whether they were financially distressed or physically distressed, and at being able to find common ground with the sellers, the property managers, and be able to ultimately convince them to sell if that's something they wish to do. And then because we didn't have the financial resources and the capital at that time to be able to buy these properties ourselves, which I wish we did, that would have been so many years ahead. But what we were forced to do was to essentially find friends and family or other people that we knew were in the business. And we used to wholesale the properties over to them. We used to have a small markup, depending on the property, what have you. And then eventually, as you start building your war chest and you build the capital up, you start buying properties yourself. And that's how we entered into that space. The reason why I did it is because I think for just as many other people have, if you want to be able to build wealth, you want to be able to build generational wealth as well. And just one day I was looking at the Forbes 500 list and I looked at almost every single person on that list had some kind of involvement with real estate. So I felt like that would be the best way for me to be able to build my wealth. But aside from that, when I was about, I want to say 13 years old, one of my cousins, we just came to America, had me visit homes with him because he had a hard time getting people to open the door. He was a real estate investor himself. So he had a hard time pe having people open the doors because he was going door to door. He was doing it the old school way. And he had me visit with him because I was a 13 year old boy, Finney George Cooney at the time. And uh, people were opening doors for me a lot easier and quicker than they were for him. I mean, I got the taste of real estate back then. I, I saw what he did. I saw a property that he actually was able to acquire, fix and flip. And I saw the money that he made at that time. It was mind boggling for me. And it was a no brainer that real estate is the way to go. And that's how we went to. I can't speak from experience. The whole George Clooney thing flo <laughs> flew right past me. The closest thing I've been told is that I, I, maybe Doug Heffernan, you remember <laughs> Kevin James from the old TV show? <laughs> of course. Of so, course. What I'd like to take a moment and talk a little bit about is that a lot of people get into fix and flipping because they've been watching HGTV. They see these things being done in 30 minutes or less, a whole re re renovation of a house. What are some of the myths you'd like to bust right now regarding getting into fix and flipping houses? It, look, don't get me wrong. I've had a project where we've purchased and as we started the construction, I think second day of construction, I had one of my contractors call us to say, there's this guy at the door asking to speak to the owner. So I'm thinking, oh man, it's probably one of the neighbors. He's going to give us a hard time right now and what have you. And long story short, it was one of the neighbors. And he said, look, I want your guys out of the house. I'm like, why? Thinking that this is probably going to be a problem here. He said, because I want to buy it. What's your price? And I just threw a foolish number out there. And he said, done. I'm taking it. It's for my son. He's getting married. I wanted to move in right next door to be, have your guys come out. Within, I think, a week and a half, we're at the contract, at the closing table. And the reason why I say that is because that was one of the very few projects that was the most easiest to sell. It was the quickest. But let me tell you, that does not happen, right? Most projects are usually a nightmare, but any business that you go into is a nightmare, especially if you're earning the big bucks. So one myth is it doesn't, your first project is probably hopefully going to be at break even, if not a small profit, but probably maybe even at a loss. And I wouldn't view it as a loss because guess what? You're going to learn a lot. You're going to gain a lot. You're going to build a network and your next project is going to be profitable enough, not only to make up for the last project that you lost on, but also then some. Keep cramming through it. Don't think it's an overnight success because many people do assume that it is. It's not. Keep ramming through it. Keep your head up high and just keep going because 
you know, that's something that you need to do to be able to succeed in this. Business. You mentioned that especially that first property or two is going to be slim when it comes to any kind of profitability. Do you find that the old adage rings true is that you make your money at the purchase and you have to learn to adjust your numbers? I look with today's inflation, I don't think it's a matter of buying, making money at the purchase. It's actually making money while you're holding on to it. Today, it's hard to find a good deal. And you got to think six months ahead, is the inflation going to continue? Our price is going to keep rising. Our rent's going to keep rising. And if they are, then you're probably going to be making money six months from now, but not today. You're probably overpaying today. But look, to answer your question, when I was in, in a fix and flip space before starting WeLen, yeah, absolutely. We were making money at the time of our purchase, not at the time of our sale, because being a good investor, having your boots on the ground, having, you know, the right people in place, you're able to find the good deals that make sense for you at the time of purchase. And of course, as time progresses, as you're working on a project, prices rise, right? They keep going on the incline. Not only are you making money out the purchase, but while you're holding on to it and definitely on the sale, that's when you reap the benefits from what you've done. Outside of the slim margins, especially when you're first starting out, what are some of those things you wished you would have known when you got started in fix and flipping? Oh man, did I open a can of worms there? I'm just thinking there's <laughs> so many things. First thing I would say is I wish I knew how to actually break people together on investment projects. And looking back today with the experience I've gained and the amount of money we raised, I wish I actually had the ability and the wherewithal to raise the capital because there were two dozen projects that I've actually wholesaled, making a minimal amount of money versus what the end well, the investor ended up making, because I did not know how to bring the people together, be able to buy the projects through other people's money. I didn't know, excuse me, I didn't know how to use a hard money lender. I didn't know how to use a private lender. I didn't know that you were able to buy a project with 10 or 15% down, regardless of whether it's missing a rule or has violations or squatters. In it. And that's something that I wish I knew back then, because I think by doing that, like I said earlier, I would have been a couple of years ahead by being able to buy these projects myself rather than making big bucks, rather than taking that small wholesale fee and moving on to the next project. You mentioned that you do a lot of your fix and flipping in New York. The property there is extremely expensive in most parts of New York. You're moving into New Jersey, but what other things are, would people be surprised at by, in regards to fix and flipping in New York? First and foremost, most of what we do today is on the lending side. So we finance real estate investors on their fix and flips. And that was a gradual kind of growth from us, right? It was wholesaler in the beginning, and this was many years ago, ultimately to a real estate investor and then developer and so on. And so today we're just supporting many of the investors that we were ourselves many years back through the financing. But to, to your point, and look, I would just always recommend that just be careful with what you're doing, know what you're doing, know what you're getting yourself into and use the right people at the right time in the right place to be able to help you get through that process. You brought up the lending platform that you're working on here now that you've developed into. And again, if you go to welendllc.com, you can learn more about Ruben's program there. But talk to me a little bit about that. Do you lend across the country? Do you stay in your backyard? Absolutely. So we lend nationwide with the exception of maybe about four or five states because of regulations and licensing requirements. But primarily, or most of our loans are in the New York, New Jersey, and the Eastern Corridor, South Carolina, Florida, and so on. Most of what we do is on the residential side, one to four units or multi-families with a mixed-use component. We go up to 90% of the purchase price and 100% of the renovations, so long as it doesn't exceed 65% of the after repair value. We close loans within as quick as seven business days, sometimes even sooner for a returning borrower, no bank statements and no tax returns needed, and we lend on almost any condition. And that's, that's a myth that I had when I was a wholesaler, right? Is that how am I going to be able to get financing on a project when the property is missing a roof? How am I going to be able to get financing on a project when there's a squatter in the property and I can't get them out? That's what private lenders are for, right? They're an alternative to a traditional financer, a traditional bank that, that wouldn't lend on a property or a condition 
of that. With the, your experience now, give people a little actionable items when it comes to picking out a partner such as yours. Like, what type of questions should they be asking to make sure it's a good fit? Look, the first things first, you want to take a look at their website. You want to take a look at their social media. And you definitely want to stay away from any lender who's demanding or asking that you pay an upfront fee for their application. And there's a lot of lenders out there who do that, and that's okay. But then the problem is that if they deny the loan for whatever reason, or they change the terms on you, a lot of times you're already locked in. Here at WeLend, we do not charge an upfront fee for any of our applications. The only upfront cost that the borrower has is the appraisal fee, and that goes directly to the appraiser and not to us. So what I would highly recommend is avoid anyone that's charging an upfront fee and definitely look at their social media platforms along with their website, just to make sure they're legitimate, see their statistics, see their numbers. Make sure that they've actually funded loans in the past that it's not just a fly-by-night company that's trying to broker loans out to someone else. Let's walk through a recent opportunity that you might have worked on. Somebody yeah. that, let's start with somebody who in the end, it didn't end, and then we'll go into a successful one. I'm just curious, as how did that look? Let's yeah, talk, absolutely. Let's start with, a, with somebody that didn't, it didn't work out. So look, today's number one issue, and that's to back to our, our original conversation, is that Numbers, deals are becoming tighter, right? People are buying not with today's evaluation, but with the expectation of that it continues to increase inflation. The issue there is that when we send an appraiser out there, the appraiser cannot look ahead. They cannot look into the future. They got to look and use the comps that have already sold in the past. And the problem there is that once they use those comps that have sold three months ago, four months ago, a month ago. It may not be that same evaluation that the investor expects six months from today, six months into the future. And a lot of times what happens, the appraisal might come in short. So as a result, you know, when that happens, when the appraisal does come in short, we do our best to try to save the deal as best as we can. But if the deal is too tight, or if the deal just doesn't make sense, instead of denying the deal outright, what we would do is we would use leverage, right? Like I said, we go up to 90% of the purchase, but if the deal is too tight, I don't want to give you 90%. I got to make sure that I'm protecting myself and my investors because I'm invested in every single loan alone alongside my investors. Essentially what I would do is I would reduce the leverage to make sure that it's conservative enough to make myself and my investors feel comfortable. A lot of borrowers are not happy about they're assuming that we're changing on them last minute, but Hey, the appraisal came in short. There's very little that we can do. So what I would recommend is be realistic. Right. We understand that the value is going to go up, but the appraiser is going to go out there and he's going to use today's cops, not tomorrow. Right. So just be realistic with your numbers, know what you're doing and know exactly what the value or expectation or range of what the realistic value is going to be when my appraiser is going to go out there to make sure that the deal makes sense. So that's been the situation is when something has gone a little sour, the numbers just haven't been adding up a little bit. Exactly. Exactly. And look. In those situations, it's not like we're walking away from the deal. We're still going to fund the deal because we ourselves understand that the value is probably going to continue growing. And guess what? Just looking at my statistics, I would say 95% of the time, the, the properties that we fund, they sell for about 10 to 15% higher than what our appraisers actually appraise the after repair value to be. And it could be a number of reasons why. One of which, especially recently, is because of the inflation and also because our investors, our appraisers rather, are a bit conservative, right? They want to be able to protect their own behind. And that's one of the other reasons why the appraisers are coming in a bit short. Sure. So well, let's talk about a successful one, Let, yep. an actual yep. example. What, how, tell yeah. us one of your successful so, projects. So recently we had a project that came along to us, and this was about two months ago in North Carolina, Myrtle Beach, I'm sorry, South Carolina, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. The sponsor was buying a, an extended stay home. And the purpose of that acquisition was to actually convert it to bones of sounds. This extended stay hotel was having a hard time. It was hit by COVID, couldn't restaff their people, what have you. The sponsor came to us because the other lender was only giving them 70% of their purchase price and no construction. We came in, we gave them 80% of their purchase price and a hundred percent of the construction. It was a very experienced sponsor. He's had 30 plus projects as his track record. He had a high net worth liquidity, but he knew what he was doing. He's been around the, uh, around the block, high FICO and the loan size was right under 7 million. Sure. Wow. So 
you I'm sure a lot of people are going to hold me accountable if I don't ask you about this. So how did these, how does the terms look in this, in your lending yeah. platform? Are you going into partnership with these people? Are you just no. simply a lender? How does it look? Exactly. So we're simply a lender. That's all we act as. We can't be a partner and deal. Our mortgage documents just don't allow it, especially because we trade a lot of these loans in the secondary market. But the way in which these deals look is just like any other mortgage. Our rates are very competitive. Today, we recently reduced our rates up and say about a week or two ago down to as low as 7.99. So we're very competitive on not only the leverage, but also on the cost and the price. Well, that's a kind of a reversal. We're starting to see mortgages tip, <laughs> tick up. So you're coming down. That's how we're trying to pick, build up the market share and, and grow our team and, and our loan volume as fast as we can, but also being able to do it to the right borrowers, right partners, sponsors. Give us a timeline as to how this process works. Somebody comes in yep. looking to work with your team and yep. get the lender. Like, so they have to have the property, of course, that they want to, they want, they purchase, but talk about the timeline. What, what needs to typically happen and what type of information would you require? Yeah. We ask for a very basic amount of information. A lot of times borrowers, especially new borrowers that are starting to work with private hard money lenders like ourselves, they can't really wrap their heads around, right? Because they're so used to working with conventional lenders or traditional lenders. They just don't understand how we need so little dots. So first things first is obviously we want to identify the property. We do a background search of the property, not background search, but just an inspection of the property. You go on Google, you go on different other versions of platforms just to take a look at it and make sure that the numbers do make sense from what they're telling us. We want to make sure they're buying at a good price. We want to make sure that their ARV of what they're expecting is reasonable. And we're not going to be put in a position where the appraiser is going to go out there and not see that same ARV or anywhere close to it. So first thing is we identify the property, do whatever, you know, inspections or research we can on it. Following that, it's the borrower, right? We identify the borrower, we will pull their credit, we get their photo ID, we get their experience. We also get a scope of work as to what their plan is with the property. Are you changing the kitchens and you ripping out the walls and ripping out the floors and what have you. And then we send our appraiser out there, ASAP. The appraisers today, they're super busy because of the refinance pool. Although it's, things are starting to trickle down, but getting a little easier, but they've been super busy recently. So. Nevertheless, we get the appraiser out there as fast as we can. You should get the appraisal back within three business days. While the appraiser is doing their work, we're also doing our work by checking the borrower's experience, by making sure that their FICOs and credit is up to par. And again, 620 credit or above is perfect credit for us. But our average credit score today is right about 690, 693. And that's really about it. Right after that, we, we have the title. We make sure that we get the entity documents that we need. And we're ready to close the loan. So within seven to 10 business days, we're at the closing table. I'm curious as to bring this up, but it sounds like a pretty straightforward process on your end. And you, we've already talked about some of the volatility we're seeing in the real estate market. What do you think you've been in the real estate investing world for a while now? What do you foresee? What's going to be? I wish I knew. And I don't, I truly don't. It's hard to predict. I have CNBC playing in the background in my office at all times. And sometimes I just shut that thing off because it's just driving me insane. Because all I'm hearing is session is coming. It's almost here. This is happening. That's happening. It's just no oh, good news. It's nothing but bad news. But look, the Goldman Sachs, right? And the others, they're all predicting a recession in 2023, mid 2023. If the rates keep climbing up, I think there's definitely going to be a stagnation or stabilization of some sort it has to happen, right? But look at what the rents are today. I was reading an article a few days ago where in Miami, I believe it was South Florida specifically, most of the renters, I want to say about 40 or 50% of the tenants of the renters in that area, 70% of their income is allocated towards rent. How can you sustain that? How long can you sustain that for? Even if you could, unless you're making $6 million a year and 70% of that is going to your rent and the remainder you're able to live off. Yeah, baby. But how can your average American sustain that. And the question then becomes, is, is there going to be a recession very soon? And not only the rents, everything else is on the high, right? So there has to be some kind of correction. The question is just when, not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. Yeah. So how does somebody prepare for it? Look, I mean, it, it's hard to prepare. And I think the only way to prepare for it is being able to sit on dry powder. The issue there is that you sit on dry powder for too long, you're losing opportunities and you're missing them left and right. So what I would highly recommend is being conservative. You know, if, like I said, a lot of our borrowers today, 
they're not looking at today's price. They're looking at what the price is going to be six months from now. Not sure if that's the right play anymore, right? Maybe it will be the right play for the next four to six months. But after that, we're getting closer to 2023. If all the, the big wigs are right, as far as in session coming in 2023, you want to be able to prepare for that and be able to be conservative with your numbers, just like we as private lenders are. And I tell borrowers that this all the time saying, look, I'm protecting you as I'm protecting myself and my investors by reducing the leverage, because by me reducing the leverage, I'm hoping that's going to force you to go out there and try to reduce the price of the property, because guess what? It's tight. And if there's any correction in the market, which again, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when you're losing. And the question is, are you going to walk away from the deal? losing money, or are you going to walk away from the deal making money? And some borrowers, guess what? They just throw in the towel and they let, you know, the property be taken over by the lender. And it's not something that we as private lenders want to do. We're not in the business to take over properties. We're in the business to keep churning the money and having it keep going out and lending to our borrowers. It's been really hard to run some numbers right now because there are so many things that are fluctuating so quickly. Whether it's a huge change in just lumber and construction costs on some things, and gas prices are crazy. And it's amazing where we're seeing all of these levers being pulled. I agree. Why one of my borrowers, he has a luxury property. He told me that he's been waiting for a sub-zero bridge for the past eight months. Can't get it. And he already built you know, the kitchen for it. He built a lot of the appliances, same prop. He just can't get them because he's just waiting for it to come in. I mean, that's, that is an issue. And as far as gas prices, it's funny you mentioned that. I ordered myself a Tesla. I said, you know what, F this, I'm done paying these gas prices. I hope it goes down, right? Because my wife still has a gas guzzler, but at the end of the day, I'm done waiting and I'm just waiting for my Tesla now. Yeah. Go Elon Musk. Yeah. <laughs> he just bought a big chunk of Twitter too. So there's a lot of stuff going on with him. With all of that, I just want to remind everybody again, we lend LLC.com. And I always want, because of all of the experience you've had in real estate investing, I always like to give people some sort of actionable thing that they can do and take home and apply to their businesses today. Yeah. So what is something, somebody who's sitting on the sidelines waiting to get into real estate investing, what's one piece of advice you'd give them? Partner up. If it's your first deal, if you're just getting into something, partner up with someone that knows what they're doing. It may be a bit more expensive because you might have to give up equity in the deal, or it might even be cheaper because they might come in with the capital, but usually the person with the experience does it. But I can tell you, Ryan, one thing, partnering up with someone will definitely get you to the finish line quicker. With the caveat, when we started as hope sailors and then ultimately started flipping ourselves. And the reason why we started flipping ourselves is yes, because we built the war chest, the capital, the liquidity to do that. But also we were able to find a private lender that time. It was a true hard money lender with 15% rates that was able to guide me through the process. So yes, it would, he was, it was, in, he was, it was in his interest to be able to force me to buy properties or make me buy properties. But at the end of the day, he also wanted me to make sure that I'm buying properties at the right price, make sure that I know the right people to put in the right time at the right place. So on it, he guided me through that process from A to Z. And I got to tell you, if you don't want to give up any of your equity by bringing in a partner that has the experience, even if you don't need the financing, definitely reach out to a private lender that can guide you through that process and educate you through all the pitfalls that are coming. It's inevitable. They're coming. That's great advice. And it's a great way to hedge against those slim margins that we're talking about. If you get, Absolutely. especially that first deal or two, it's always better to have half an apple than no apple at all. <laughs> that I agree with. That I yeah. agree with. This has been a great conversation, but before I let you go, I always want to ask, is there a question or a concept you wish we would have covered here today? I think, look, I think you did an amazing job. I think you covered all the bases. The only thing that I would recommend to many of the listeners is don't sit on the sidelines. You're missing out. There's great opportunities out there, but definitely be cautious and definitely bring yourself people around you that can help guide you through the process. And podcasts like this, and like I told you right before we jumped on, I've listened to a few of your podcasts last night, and I think they're very informative and educational. And I would highly recommend to many people to listen to podcasts like yours to be able to get them to the finish line. I appreciate you those kind words. And uh, I can't say enough because I believe there is so much content out there that is freely available. In fact, I believe you have a YouTube channel. Isn't that correct? I believe we do. 
I believe we do. We're yeah. on many social media platforms. Our handle is at Weland LLC. We're even on TikTok, I believe. So we're very big on social media. Yeah, I've been playing with TikTok. I, may, maybe that's it's the Gen Xer in me. I don't quite <laughs> get it yet, but uh, it's a fine art. <laughs> Every time I log in there, I'm get I'm greeted with like, why is this being shown to me? But yeah, it's a different platform, I tell you. That it is. That it is. Thank you, Ruben. This has been a great conversation. You're welcome back anytime. I hope you'll take Appreciate me up it. on that. And yeah, absolutely. it's always great to have George Clooney on the show. <laughs> I appreciate the compliment. <laughs> we'll catch you later. Thank you, sir. You got it, Jack.